my pleasure to be here tonight and to give you this lecture on the, the dawn of gravitational wave astronomy. That was the official title. Uh, but when we were up in the Vangarei, uh, the local society there actually said, you know, we changed your title, I hope you don't mind. Uh, it's now going to be When Black Holes Collide. Uh, and to be honest, I thought it was an even better title. Uh, so I've adopted that title uh, and we'll be talking about colliding black holes. Um, indeed, this is a very new uh, field of astronomy. Um, so I'll start actually much closer to home uh, on familiar turf uh, here in our own solar system with the Sun. Um, the Sun is our star, here shown to, uh, to size with the Earth, uh, but actually not to distance. Uh, luckily we are much further from the Sun than in this picture. Um, but the Sun is a glowing ball of gas and uh, it is eventually the way we get our energy here on Earth. Um, and the sun shines, as we have noticed nicely today as well, the sun shines because it's hot. And anything you make hot will actually start shining. You notice if you put a poker into the fire, you see that at one point it starts to glow, and it becomes hot, it starts to radiate, it loses energy. And the question is, why does the sun lose energy? Why actually is the sun hot? Well, that is because the sun is an equilibrium between two forces. On the one hand, we have the force of uh, gravity, here denoted by the, uh, the black arrows, trying to get all that gas in the sun in a volume that is as small as possible. So gravity will always try to get all the mass closer, to, closer together. At the same time, uh, we have gas pressure pushing outwards. This is the same as in your tires, that's why you uh, have such a comfortable ride in your car, because the gas pressure actually keeps this inflated. So those two forces between gas pressure and gravity are in equilibrium with each other. And as long as that is the case, the Sun will actually be as large as it is. The problem with that is that uh, to get that gas pressure going, the gas needs to be hot. Um, and hot gas glows, so it loses energy on the outside. So the thing is that uh, all the energy that is lost on the outside needs to be replenished. And it is replenished in the center of the Sun. So the Sun runs uh, uh, nuclear fusion in its center uh, to basically compensate for the losses of energy on the outside of uh, the, the star to keep this equilibrium going. And the way the Sun creates energy in the center is through nuclear fusion and specifically the, the fusion of hydrogen into helium. So four protons, which are the cores of the hydrogen atom, fused through a nuclear fusion chain eventually to helium. And that process is the most efficient way of generating uh, energy that we know of, um, much more than uh, nuclear fission. Uh, this is nuclear fusion, so you actually fuse the elements together. Uh, and the sun, sun did, does this very uh, efficiently in the center, uh, but still, to be able to withstand gravity, it needs to consume a thousand of these supertankers full of hydrogen per second. So the sun is turning every second, it's using 600 million tons of hydrogen into a helium every second. Again, and again, and again, and again, a thousand of these tankers. On and on and on it goes, and it shows how immensely massive the sun is that it is able to do this for 10 billion years. The lifetime of the Sun doing this nuclear fusion is 10 billion years. We're about halfway and the Sun is 4.6 billion years old, the same as the Earth, because the Earth and the Sun were uh, formed at the same time. So it still has 5 point something billion years to go, but it turns this, this hydrogen into helium for 10 billion years. But eventually it will run out of fuel. Eventually there will no, be no more hydrogen to uh, fuse into helium. So that is what we call the death of a star. Um, but we can also say, you know, what, how did it all start? So look at the birth of a star. So here in a very, uh, uh, in one slide, is a very brief summary of stellar evolution. When I teach this course to my students, I, it takes seven weeks, but I'm sure that I can do it with you in seven seconds. Um, so we have uh, a gas cloud in interstellar space that's for some reason collapses. It becomes unstable and under its own gravity and starts to collapse. It might be that it's triggered by a nearby supernova or another galaxy passing by, um, but it collapses into a star and then we have two different 
op options, two different possibilities. If we have a star like the Sun, which is actually a very normal light star, and we often express the masses of stars in solar masses, so the Sun per definition has one solar mass. Um, if it is a star like the Sun, so this phase of hydrogen fusion, which is denoted here with this yellow sphere, this phase of hydrogen fusion is by far the longest phase in the life of any star, uh, certainly uh, that of the Sun as well. So 10 billion years, and then it runs out of fuel, and what now happens is in the center the core starts to shrink, and at the same time the outer layers of the star will, will uh, uh, start to grow, and it will become what we call a red giant. At that point, the Sun will be as large as the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. So what you have to imagine is that at that point, some, some 5 billion years into the future, the Sun will fill half of the sky, and not just be this little sphere there, but it will fill half of the sky. It will have cooled down a little bit, because it's no longer 6,000 degrees at that point, but only 3,000 degrees. <laughs> so it will show a little bit reddish, uh, but uh, it will fill half of the sky. The sky. Um, so the eventual fate of the Earth is that it will be scorched. Um, because you can imagine if the sun fills half of the sky and it is 3,000 degrees, it's going to be pretty hot here. So basically, at that point, uh, all of the Earth will look like Australia. Um, <laughs> it's just scorched, it's just nothing left there. Um, then, the next phase is that those outer layers get uh, uh, ejected into outer space in a rather gentle process, which we call a planetary nebula. It has nothing to do with planets, but it is a historic name. Um, so it's basically the expulsion of the outer layers of the star like the sun and the burned out core sits in the middle and that core actually evolves into what we call a white dwarf. And a white dwarf is an object that has half of the mass of the sun in a volume only the size of the earth. So what that means is that the density of the object is pretty high. If you take a mid-sized car and you are able to squeeze that into a sugar cube that's pretty difficult, even in these pressures. Uh, but a car into a super cube, a sugar cube, uh, that is the density of a white dwarf. So that is already pretty difficult to get on Earth. But things get more interesting and more extreme when we go to massive stars. So with massive stars, and then I'm talking about stars that started their life with a, uh, with a mass of more than eight times the, sun, the mass of the Sun, those massive stars actually follow a slightly different path. First, uh, they live uh, much shorter. Even though they are much more massive, they actually consume that fuel at a much more rapid pace than a star like the Sun. So instead of 10 billion years of fusing hydrogen into helium, it may only take 10 million years, so a thousand times shorter, 10 million years, for that star to consume all of its fuel. Uh, so stars are like cars. Hey, the bigger the car, the, the more often you are at the fuel pump. Uh, because they are more inefficient. Um, so these massive stars, they actually fuse that hydrogen into helium and subsequently helium into carbon and oxygen, that is also done by the sun, but then carbon and oxygen to silicon and magnesium and eventually to iron. And iron for us is a rather ordinary element, there's nothing strange about iron, we use it every day, uh, but iron is actually a very special element because it is the most bound element. If you fuse two iron cores together, you don't get energy out of that process, but it, uh, you need to put in energy. Um, so nuclear fusion stops at iron. Regular nuclear fusion stops at iron. Um, and then, at that point, the uh, source of energy in the center of the star disappears. Right? There is no way that the star can actually make more energy out of fusion, so that gravity says, ha, ah, thank you, I'll just collapse the star. So the inner parts of the star, that iron core, now collapse and actually form a sphere uh, that, uh, what we call a neutral star, a sphere that is only 10 kilometers, 10 kilometers in radius, but it contains one and a half million, uh, one and a half times the mass of the sun. And to put that analogy again of a sugar cube, now you don't have to put a car in a sugar cube to get that kind of density, but all of mankind. Seven billion people, if, the, if somehow we're able to squeeze all the people on earth into a sugar cube, that is the density that you get in a neutron star. 
What happens is that that neutral star is formed in the center of the star and it is basically an extremely stiff, hard ball in the center of the star. And the outer layers now start to fall onto that, but they bounce on that. And because of the conservation of momentum, what happens is that in the bounce, the outer layers get an enormous velocity of more than 10,000 kilometers per second. So in four seconds you would be around the Earth. Uh, for uh, 10,000 kilometers per second, and that matter is ejected into outer space uh, in a giant explosion which we call a supernova. So a supernova, or more specifically a core collapse supernova, is the end of a very massive star. Um, and in that process then what le is left over is either the neutral star, or if too much of that additional mass is accumulated on the neutron star, we get a black hole. And a black hole is therefore the end product of the life of a very, very massive star. Those massive stars are really rare. It's no more than 1% of all the stars that actually follow this path, and 99% of the stars that follow that path. Um, but still, with 100 billion stars in our own Milky Way galaxy, uh, black holes are uh, created quite often. Uh, once every century, or maybe once every couple of centuries a new black hole is formed in our Milky Way galaxy. And so these neutral stars and black holes, they are very extreme objects. As I mentioned, if we take the island of Manhattan or Auckland or something like that, at two sides, a neutral star would then be a radius of 10 kilometers, one and a half times the mass of the sun. And a black hole, yeah, well, you know, is it possible to put a size on a black hole? Uh, yes, it is. Um, and that size is the Schwarzschild radius, which you just mentioned. Um, that, that was in the correspondence between Einstein and Schwarzschild. Um, he calculated the Schwarzschild radius as the event horizon of a telescope. Now, what is a Schwarzschild radius and what is an event horizon? So, for anybody that has mass, you need a certain uh, velocity to get away from it, to break free of that uh, object. So for the Earth, uh, which is a, uh, has a pretty high mass, um, we need a certain uh, velocity to get away from it. If I can jump up, I'll come down again. If I jump up even better, uh, I'll get a little bit higher, not much, uh, but I will come down again. I would need to get a velocity of 11 kilometers per second to be able to break free of the Earth. So for instance, the satellites that we send out to the outer planets, like New Horizons, which uh, in a few months we'll encounter again uh, one of the outer bodies in the solar system, uh, to really get free of the solar system, and if you start at the sun, uh, you need to get a velocity of 600 kilometers per second. Um, so the, so the escape velocity from the sun is already 600 kilometers per second, so much more than the Earth, which is 11. Um, to break free of a neutron star, you already need to go at half of the speed of light. And so you need to go at 150 kilometers per second to break free of the surface of a neutral star. Uh, if you don't go that fast, inevitably you come down, back down again. Now what Schwarzschild and Einstein were doing, sort of uh, calculating, uh, is, okay, well, suppose that I were to compress this even more, this neutral star, would there be a moment where the escape velocity would exceed the speed of light? At that point, nothing would be able to escape from this object anymore. And that point, when the escape velocity is equal to the speed of light, is what we call the Schwarzschild radius. radius. <coughs> and that is also what we uh, generally call the radius of a black hole. So for an object with uh, a mass of one and a half times the mass of the sun, that Schwarzschild radius would be four and a half kilometers. So if anything gets within four and a half kilometers of the, the singularity which is at the center of the black hole, um, to get away from it again, it would need to be going faster than the speed of light. And nothing can go faster than the speed of light, not even light. Um, so that is why we call a black hole black. Uh, it is dark, there's nothing being emitted from within the Schwarzschild radius. And a more proper way of thinking about a black hole is as an information barrier. So basically what it means is that 
Once you're inside the Schwarzschild radius, you're decoupled from the rest of the universe. There's no way that you can communicate again with the people outside of the uh, Schwarzschild radius. So, for instance, if you were to yeah, give me that camera uh, and you throw me into a black hole, I can record what's happening. And it just keeps on recording, keeps on recording, and I go through the Schwarzschild radius. Let's suppose this, this bench is the Schwarzschild radius, I'm now inside the black hole. I can keep recording what's going on. <coughs> and so I now have, for me, solved the, the, the puzzle of what's inside the black hole, but there's no way that I can tell you about it. Because that information would need to go faster than the speed of light to reach you, and that is not possible. So this is the, the definition of a black hole. And we have quite a few of them, and this is a, another depiction of a black hole. So here's the actual hole with and the information barrier. So that a Schwarzschild radius is also often called the event horizon. And so this is the horizon from which, uh, beyond which, we will not see any events, any information anymore. So in, inside, uh, what's happening inside this black hole, we have no idea. Mathematically, there should be a singularity in the uh, center of the black hole. And the singularity means that uh, the, the, the disruption of space-time goes to infinity at that point. That is the mathematical description. I am an, an astronomer, a physicist, and I, I don't deal with uh, mathematics. Well, I do deal with mathematics, but singularities sit quite poorly with me. Um, I don't know what's happening inside that black hole. Is there still matter? If I throw in a car, I'm throwing in actual matter. I'm throwing in a whole bit of iron and rubber and whatever, a couple of wheels. Um, so where do they stay? What, what's happening there? That we actually don't know what's going on. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, there's no way to find out. Um, uh, black holes often uh, are accompanied by uh, disks of gas. For instance, if there's a companion around it, another star, um, or if it's in the center of a galaxy, then it has a gas disk around it, which we call an accretion disk. And matter in this disk will uh, spiral inwards towards the black hole and eventually go through the event uh, horizon. Um, but this, uh, a small part of that uh, accretion disk will not go through, but by the magnetic fields in this disk will be uh, 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 deflected from, away from the black hole, and uh, through the magnetic fields they will get an acceleration, and the particles will actually escape from this configuration <coughs> of a black hole with a disk with almost the speed of light. And that is what we call a relativistic jet, um, and so these, sometimes you see these relativistic jets and it looks like they are particles that come from the black hole, but they're not. So this is part of the disk, gas disk around it, uh, that now gets ejected into outer space with almost the speed of light. So it's actually these particles that get deflected outwards and then poof, they be sent off into infinity. Um, a common misconception about black holes is that they suck in matter. This is uh, what we always see in, in, in bad movies and uh, sometimes in, in, in bad journalism, uh, that they suck in matter. Uh, black holes have gravity, yes. They're the same like the Earth has gravity um, and the Sun has gravity. But black holes don't have an additional force that really actively sucks it in. If we were to replace the Sun right now with a black hole of the same mass of the Sun, so one solar mass of black hole at the position of the Sun, nothing would happen with the Earth. The Earth would just keep on going in its orbit around now the black hole for eternity. Um, the light would go out, that's the thing what would happen, uh, but it's not that all of a sudden the Earth all gets sucked, uh, gets sucked into the new black hole. Um, so these black holes, they're, they're quite common. Uh, as I mentioned, they are made at the end of life of very massive stars. Um, and that is what we call stellar mass black holes. Those are the ones that I will be talking about today. And we know another type of uh, black hole, which we call the supermassive black holes. And they have masses of a million to a billion times the mass of the Sun. So much, much more massive than the ones that we will be talking about. Um, and they sit at the heart of a galaxy. So also in our Milky Way galaxy, we have a supermassive black hole of 4 million solar masses 
Uh, but I won't be talking about those supermassive black holes. I'll be talking about the stellar mass of black holes. Um, and um, the one thing that is also interesting about the sun is that it is going through life alone. Uh, well, almost alone. It has eight planets uh, and a couple of small things around it. Um, but it is a single star. And if we look in the universe, if we look out uh, to the stars, uh, we see that most stars are actually not single, they are in a binary system. So we have two stars going around each other, gravitationally bound to each other. Um, and if they are close enough, and, uh, sorry, and uh, a very famous one is Sirius, uh, the brightest star in the sky, it was actually found that Sirius, the one that we see, has a very faint companion, which is actually one of these white dwarfs, so these stellar remnants of Loma stars, uh, called Sirius B, and it goes around this in about 75 years. Um, if the two stars are close enough, uh, very interesting things uh, happen during the evolution of the two stars. Um, so suppose that we have two very massive stars, and it turns out that massive stars are almost always in binaries. So 100% of massive stars actually is in a binary or even a multiple system. So with more than uh, two stars in one system. Um, suppose that we have two of them, so a very massive one and a slightly less massive, but still one that can go supernova. If we then follow the evolution, what happens is that the, the more massive one is the first to evolve away, to consume all of its nuclear fuel, swell up, and actually explode as a supernova. And if it's really massive, that would form a black hole. Now the second one is basically unaltered during this process, but it is also massive enough to uh, process all that uh, fuel into iron and then have uh, another supernova going off. So now we have a supernova going off around an object that is already a black hole, and the product of this might be a binary black hole. The two black holes that go around each other. Now that would be very interesting to see what happens around there. Um, so uh, from a binary evolutionary point of view, uh, we would love to see a binary black hole. Um, we can try and do this with an optical telescope, and I can show you a picture. This is what a binary black hole looks like with an optical telescope. Right? Clearly, it's there. And the, the, the defining character of, of a black hole is that no light is coming out from any the curtains. Sorry? From any close curtains. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, maybe we can see it better then, right? Um, so there's no light coming out whatsoever. So with optical telescopes or with radio telescopes or UV or, or uh, uh, X-rays, gamma rays, they all use light. They all use electromagnetic radiation. And there's no way to see a binary black hole. And this is the, 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 the big breakthrough that we've had over the last few years because there is one way of actually finding a binary black hole. And that is through gravitational waves. So in 1916, a few months after Einstein published his theory on general relativity, he himself actually realized that something else should be happening if his theory was correct. So what does uh, general relativity describe? It describes the structure of space and time. And uh, Einstein said, well, actually, space and time are not uh, separate things. They are basically the same. We know of three dimensions of space, yeah, up, sideways, and that way. And then there is time, yeah, which is also going in a certain direction. And for us, it's always going in the forward direction. But you actually should see, should see that as one thing, space-time, think about it. Um, space-time, and space-time is not nothing. Space-time forms a structure in the universe. It is a framework in the universe in which things move and happen, etc. Um, and the only way that you can influence space-time is with mass. If there's mass somewhere, it deforms space-time in the sense that it makes the path of anything moving through space and time uh, curved. So it deviates, uh, it makes the path deviate from the original path. So if I you know, were to go through space-time and I have a certain velocity, I would get a very regular pattern moving through space-time. 
Um, now, if there's a lot of mass, say you all combined, uh, what will happen is that through that mass, uh, the space-time is bent, and my path is actually deviating. So instead of going straight, uh, straight on, uh, I show it a deviation in the path that I'm uh, following. Um, this happens, uh, and this deviation we all know as gravity. And this is what gravity does. If we have a very massive object, like for instance the Earth, and then anything moving uh, through space that comes close to the Earth is now being deflected in its path through gravity. Um, and this, the Earth has this around the Sun as well. And the reason why the Earth is going around the Sun is because the gravity of the Sun uh, is, is altering the path continuously. Even though the Earth would like to go straight on, it is now being altered and is being pulled into a, uh, a circular path around the Sun. So this was the description of space-time that, that Einstein came up with. Now that's all good and well if you have a stationary mass. If that mass that is actually causing the gravity, like the Sun or the Earth, is just sitting there. But if itself that mass is being accelerated, Einstein realized in two papers, one from 1916 and another one from 1918, um, that that would cause ripples in that space-time. So an accelerated mass causes ripples, and like throwing a stone in a pond, it actually goes, the space-time itself starts to vibrate, um, and uh, these ripples in space-time are gravitational waves. That's what gravitational waves are, they are ripples in space-time caused by accelerated masses. And the nice thing is that if you have two masses, like two binary black holes that go around each other, they are continuously being accelerated. And to be in a circular orbit means that you're continuously being accelerated because if there was no force pulling you sideways, continuously pulling you sideways, you would just shoot off in one direction. So two, orbit, two objects that are in orbit around each other are always accelerated. <coughs> so the fantastic thing about that is that that means that that should cause ripples in space-time that being that are continuously excited. So a binary black hole will always uh, emit gravitational waves, will always emit ripples in space-time. Um, and that actually has a consequence when that happens. Because if you, <coughs> if you want to set up ripples in the pond, and you want these to be continuously being excited, continuously going on, and you need to keep on stirring, you need to continuously yes, stir the surface of the pond to keep these, these waves going. The moment you stop, then the waves will continue to go out, but no new waves will be added. So you need to put in, then you have to do work in physics terms, and you need to put in energy to keep this going. So a binary that goes around and around and around and around and is continuously stirring up uh, space-time needs energy to do this. And that energy can, can come from only one place, and that is the binding energy of the binary itself. In other words, the distance between the two objects. So because it is losing energy, uh, it is at the expense of the separation between the two objects. So what that means is that while these gravitational waves are being emitted, the two objects get closer and closer and closer together. In other words, uh, if we were to follow this in time, what we would see is that these ripples in space-time would occur, but as the, the two stars or the two black holes come closer and closer together, the amplitude of this goes up, because the closer they are together, the faster they go, and the higher the acceleration is that they, that they feel, and therefore the, the, the larger the amplitude is of the ripples that are being uh, made by this um, uh, binary, um, so the amplitude goes up, but what we also see is that the frequency goes up, so the this separation between the, the crests is getting shorter and shorter as we progress, and that is because the binary is losing energy, so it's also coming closer together and going faster and faster around each other. And you can imagine that eventually this, this leads to disaster. Right? This, this can't go well, because these two get closer and closer and closer, and at one point they have to collide. And when the Schwarzschild radii get together for, for uh, black holes, something needs to happen. But if these were physical bodies, if these were neutron stars, for instance, 
and they would just really collide. They would smash into each other uh, when the separation is smaller than the size of the individual object. So things happen. So this was realized by Einstein in, 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 in 1916 already. Um, but he said, you know, at his time, in his time we didn't know about neutron stars. Uh, the concept of black holes was around, but that there could be a binary black hole following from binary evolution, that was unknown. Um, but he already doubted that gravitational waves would ever be detected. And the reason is the following, that the amplitude of these ripples in space-time being set up is extremely small. In other words, space-time is very stiff. It's very difficult to excite. Um, and we can actually try to understand how difficult it is to do this. What type of precision do you need to be able to uh, measure these ripples in space-time? Now suppose, eh, so this is Einstein thinking about this. Well, this is actually an example I took from a colleague, uh, but it's very nice. Suppose you have a large body of water, Lake Taupo, well known to you, not too far from here. Uh, biggest lake in, in New Zealand. Um, lake Taupo has a... Um, surface area of 616 square kilometers and so it's something like 20 by 30 kilometers um, uh, in surface area um, that is 6.1 times 10 to the 12 uh, so 6.1 and then 10 uh, to 12 zeros square centimeters very small square centimeters so there's lots of them um, and now uh, what we're doing is that we're adding one drop of water to Lake Town, a single drop of water, and even a pretty big one because it is a, 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 a cubic centimeter, so a super cubic basically. We're adding that one drop to the whole lake, and nothing else changes. It's just the one thing that changes. Now, conceptually, you can understand that the level of the lake needs to go up by this, right? It's, it's clear because we're adding, yeah, I've got two cups of water here. I didn't even ask for it, but now I can actually do this experiment, right, right here. Yeah, so this one is uh, a little bit full. That's full, if I add uh, a drop, oh, that's more than a drop, then the level went up. So the same will happen with Lake Tahoe. If I put in an additional drop of water of a cubic centimeter, the level will go up. And now we can calculate by how much. So dH, delta H, is the, the, the amount of uh, level, water level rise in Lake Taupo by adding one droplet to it. So that is one over the surface area, because that, that drop spreads itself over the whole surface area. Um, so there's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 13, it's difficult to see with the projector, but it says minus 13. So that is 0.0000000001 that is the level by which Lake Taupo went up, because I let one additional drop into the lake. Um, now, next to a, an absolute value, we would also like to know relatively how much did the, the water level uh, change. So then we have to look at the, the average depth, which is 110 meters. So the relative change in the water level is that that changed delta H here, this tiny little number, now divided by 110 meters, and this is 1.5 times 10 to the minus 17. That's the relative change, uh, and that is this very, very tiny little number. Um, this is the kind of precision that any experiment that wants to get gravitational waves, that will want to detect gravitational waves, needs to be able to do. So we need to build a machine that is actually able to measure the effect of us adding a single drop of water to Lake Tahoe. So a normal water gauge will, won't do it, right? <laughs> that was by far too, uh, too crude to do it. Um, and this is the reason why it took 100 years before we could actually detect that. Right? Because technology needed to advance and advance and advance to uh, the level that we can actually have a machine that is uh, sensitive enough to do it. Uh, luckily, nowadays we have that, and that is using lasers, another invention by Einstein, by the way. Einstein came up with the uh, basic idea of a laser. Um, and uh, what we do is that we have two lasers. In an interferometer, a laser beam is split into two beams. Mirrors reflect the beams, so they meet again at the starting point. If now the distance to each mirror is exactly the same, 
no light will be seen by the detector. The waves of one beam extinguish those of the other beam. This is called interference. A passing gravitational wave distorts space, making one arm slightly shorter and the other arm a little longer. The light waves do not cancel each other anymore, and we now measure a tiny signal in the detector. Now you can do this in the lab, and you can just set up uh, a laser system that does that, but that isn't big enough. Uh, you need to do this on a massive scale. And the, the three instruments that are currently operational to do this are the two LIGO detectors. So this is one LIGO detector in Louisiana, in, in the US, and this is the other LIGO detector in uh, Washington State, in, in northwestern US. And we see the same setup of a beam splitter and mirror and mirror. So the one mirror sits here at the end of this long vacuum tube. This whole tube is vacuum. And the other one sits there right off the screen. And these are four kilometer long arms. And through these arms, these lasers are being shot to the end where the mirror sits. Then they are reflected back to the central building, the same way from the other arm. And in the central building, and the light is combined and put to the detector. This is the Virgo detector in, near Pisa, the, the, here's the town of Pisa um, in Italy. That's the European one and that's the American one. And these three instruments are the most sensitive instruments ever built by humans. Because they are capable of detecting this tiny, tiny, tiny little change in the distance between the mirrors uh, with these lasers going up and down. And this is an amazing achievement because, as you can imagine, if you are sensitive to such a small change, you see everything else as well. And you see the waves crashing on the beach. You see the farmer uh, next door mowing the grass. You see any little tremor from an earthquake around the world, you see. Um, so they, the, the, the technological uh, achievement here is enormous because they had to isolate these mirrors from anything that goes around in the world. Uh, and that is really an achievement to do. The development of these, these detectors started almost 30 years ago. Um, and since then they've been improving and improving and improving and trying and improving and trying and improving, etc. Et and in 2000.